Thought for the day on Wednesday, God's Mighty Hand Part 3. We're continuing to explore the way that God showed his strength in the book of Exodus to rescue his people from slavery in Egypt. Yesterday we looked at the first of the ten plagues of Egypt. Today we've gone straight to the tenth one. You might want to catch up by uh, reading uh, the chapters in between. The tenth and most terrible plague uh, goes like this. This is from Exodus chapter 12. Tell the whole community of Israel, God said to Moses, that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. The animals you choose must be year old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they're to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt." The last and most terrible plague, the striking down of every firstborn in Egypt on both people and animals. And um, this is the very last uh, step that God can possibly take. Pharaoh has resisted nine different opportunities he's had before, nine different calls on him to let God's people go, and he's refused each time. And remember how the beginning of uh, Exodus, um, uh, how at the beginning of the story, uh, the Pharaoh wanted to kill all the uh, male children of the Israelites who were born, and eventually God says, uh, you are going to suffer that same fate yourself. You're going to lose your firstborn son, as would all the families of Egypt, because effectively, what else is going to happen to persuade you to let God's people go? Um, I, I personally imagine God with great reluctance pronouncing this plague on Egypt. Uh, it's hard to imagine God doing something reluctantly, but I, I can't imagine God, as it were, enjoying this punishment on Egypt. But Pharaoh himself has brought his nation to this point by his refusal to obey God. Now, what's really significant, as well as the terrible destructiveness that is uh, meted out on Egypt, is the way that God saves his own people. I guess God could have just said to the Israelites, well, it's okay, you don't need to do anything, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to overlook your houses. But rather, God sets out for them in this passage a particular mechanism by which they're going to demonstrate their faith in God and that that faith is going to uh, uh, rescue them from the terrible destructive plague. God says to them, you're going to take this Passover lamb, kill it, and paint its blood on the doorposts and on the lintels of your houses. Now, it, it's not made explicit, but, but I sort of feel here that there's an opportunity for anyone to take part in that. You see, the Israelites who'd failed to obey God would, according to this, would have suffered the same destructive plague as Egypt. If they didn't kill the lamb, if they didn't paint its blood, their firstborn sons would have died as well. And I wonder whether if any Egyptians who were sympathetic to the Israelite cause wanted to avoid the same destructive plague and were prepared to obey and trust God, whether they could have done the same. As I say, it's not explicit. But the point is that God, look, God says, look, here's how you're going to avoid the plague. You're going to paint the blood. And therefore, it was absolutely vital for every Israelite family to do that. And if they said, well, we, we don't really believe in all this. We're, you know, we think that what's happened to Egypt is just a load of coincidences. It's not really God's mighty hand at work. Well, if they'd really thought that and hadn't taken action, then they'd have lost their sons. God says, look, I, I will, I, I'm, I'm willing uh, not, to, uh, uh, not to let your firstborn sons die, but please indicate to me that you really want me to do that. Indicate that you trust me. And of course, what happened that night is that um, the firstborn in all of uh, the Egyptian families died. Uh, the firstborn in every Israelite family was kept safe because they faithfully painted the blood on their doorposts and on the lintels of their houses. And that night they left Egypt. Pharaoh said, I've had enough. Now I will let you go. And so they escaped. That was the exodus. They left Egypt in a single night. 
But I suspect that uh, later on, looking back, those firstborn sons of Israel, uh, telling the story perhaps to their own sons and grandsons, said, you know, that night I would have died if the lamb hadn't been killed and its blood painted on the outside of our house. That lamb died so that I might live. Uh, you probably know that in the New Testament, that image of the Passover lamb is picked up and applied to Jesus. John the Baptist said, look, he's the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 5, here's the verse on the screen. He says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. In other words, he sees in the Passover, along with all the other uh, New Testament writers, and I think Jesus himself, said, look, this is a little picture beforehand of what Jesus would do. Die so that we might live. Let's thank God in a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the way that you rescued your people in Egypt and even provided this picture of their faith in you, uh, which, uh, as it were, activated your saving power. And we thank you that the Passover lamb is such a potent image for us of what Jesus did by his death. And we ask that we may, as it were, apply his blood to our lives day by day, trusting in you alone for our salvation in his name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming. So I hope to see you tomorrow.